Forward. Gaining ground. Do you recall, I mean fully recall, those rare, unplanned, one-on-one conversations you've had from time to time? Conversations that took you past all the surface noise in your life, the golfling banter, the superficial structures of meaning, to a set of ideas that seemed much more true and left you with that, ah, so this is what it's all about, feeling? You are about to start one of those conversations as you begin Bruce Piasecki's Doing More With Less, a short book, but not a small one. Bruce asks you to study the practice of business, or any social undertaking for that matter, at the level of calling. We all instinctively understand the idea of calling and understand that calling asks, why are you doing what you're doing? And can I stand four square, morally and intellectually, with the choices I make? Bruce uses an interesting word, machine-like in this book, and by it, he means the opposite of calling. The one is energized, fully committed, imaginative. The other is dull, automatic, deprived of feeling. The general calling he explores in this book is frugality, and as a central idea, it echoes importantly on every page. By the time you close the back cover of this book, it's likely your head will be buzzing as you consider ways in which you can realign your own enterprise in response to the shifting conditions of life that Bruce enumerates. This book cultivates a special sense of social purpose in capitalism as it refines your particular instincts for innovation and survival. Look, for example, at Walmart management from Piasecki's point of view. Their executives are responsible for a vast corporate entity. But as the world changed, Walmart didn't have to abandon its core business model or its motto. Save money, live better. To become a massive champion of solar power. All they had to do was to realize that their flat store roofs average two acres and that they have almost 8,000 stores globally. By championing solar power, they were doing more with less. Bing! This book explores what Piasecki coins this art of competitive frugality. Here are some of the newly important conditions explored in this book. Dynamics between society and business in the near future. Personal thrift. Executive authenticity. Product durability instead of disposability. Market stability in a time of globalization. Incentives for cultural safety public and business continuity, insights into wealth creation and creativity. The book adds, in short order and with wit and speed, insights into the literature of globalization, product development, change management, and general management, as it provides an original take on the increasing role that sustainability and energy issues play in competitiveness. This book could not be better timed for our new century. We all know we're at the brink. Bruce Piasecki gives us the framework to look at what's next, without tottering toward failure. We can feel it in our bones that we're poised at the stroke of midnight, and even the current or recent, depending on your perspective, recession feels like an ecological metaphor. That is, like a system out of control and pushed past its limits and natural carrying capacity. It's in the spirit of these ideas that Bruce poses the challenge to all of us who are connected, in various ways, to the world of enterprise. How do you use your creative and innovative talents in this swift and severe world to free yourself from your self-inhibiting rationalizations, adjust the compass of your professional life, and then bring fresh direction to the endeavors you manage and influence? His vision is a new way to better align money, people, and rules— and his insights are global and of immediate application, as I heard folks say to leaders in government, business, and society at our Gaining Ground Summit. What all of this comes down to, in my view, is the principal responsibility of every business leader and every reader concerned about social trends to cultivate a reliable and favorable view of the future, not the next quarter, but the near and certain future where our own endeavors prepare a world for our successors. To his credit, and your clear good fortune as a reader, Bruce believes in the creative power in this return to frugality. That is to say, 
He believes in you. Leaders and innovators in business, corporate, and technical spheres, and in your fundamental ability to take stock of change, both short-term and tectonic, and make a creative, adaptive, resilient response. He knows this will not be easy, but it is a satisfying transformation before you. I have more the sensibility of a hand wringer than Bruce Piasecki, and I share the serious worries of his colleagues, Jared Diamond, Ronald Wright, James Howard Kunstler, Thomas Homer Dixon, and James Lovelock. In essence, these popular observers say that enough is neither enough nor soon enough. In reading Bruce Piasecki's work, however, I guess the purpose of his approach and tone is different from those who alert us to impending catastrophe. Piasecki is in the game to change the game. Piasecki writes like a social historian, but with the color of a man in action. He is changing the game as he observes its patterns. Of course, we still need to prepare for something worse than swiftness and severity. Namely, many of us know we need to prepare for catastrophe. Catastrophe in our financial and corporate and personal institutions. Catastrophe is highly disruptive and it breaks down systems. As examples, such as the earthquake in Haiti and Hurricane Katrina, clearly demonstrate to all of us. While aware of the worsening trends, Piasecki sees through all this swiftness and severity and gives you here a set of lasting principles about how we will survive. He is very much about surfing the change to avoid catastrophe. Of course, a pessimist is just a worried optimist. Along with Bruce Piasecki, I have the hope that our instincts for self-preservation, our desire for social justice, and our appetite for well-being will lead to an era of unprecedented innovation in the marketplace and in community life. Paradoxically, as this book before you dramatically indicates, mostly in the middle chapters, scarcity itself opens new innovative markets. And herein lies the magic that makes this book moving. Toward the final chapters of this book, Bruce's at times quirky but mesmerizing insights into competition and its complex relationship to frugality grow into an awareness of social diplomacy in a fashion I've never read anywhere else. You cannot say that about many books, except those that last due to their sensibility and humanity. By the final chapters on Tomorrow and Freedom and Fate, you will have traveled a long way indeed. By chapter four, I felt almost as if I were reading an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson or another social philosopher of consequence, such as Matthew Arnold. In the process, Piasecki has persuaded and delighted a set of us to become more hopeful, more active. After all, thrift, apart from its conventional meaning, also can be considered a new roadmap for the allocation of resources, even saved money has energy and utility. As Bruce notes, this book offers you a pledge and a promise to find a new creativity in scarcity. For the past two decades, I have organized the Gaining Ground Urban Sustainability Conferences in the Pacific Northwest. Increasingly, we are a stopover and a sensing platform for some of the best world thinkers on growth and sustainability. Bruce was a keynote speaker at the second Gaining Ground conference titled Whole City Change back in 2007. He shared the podium with one of the godfathers of sustainability, Paul Hawken, developer extraordinaire John Knott, real estate valuation visionary Scott Muldivan, and Pamela Mang, founding member of Regenesis and creator of the extraordinary city building process called Story of Place. Also at the conference to study North American sustainability thought and practice were more than a dozen of China's top environmental and sustainability leaders. And learn they did from Piasecki and Hawken. To this day, I remember Bruce's deft narrative. Go green or go broke. To appreciate how provocative and trendsetting this was, cast your mind back. Sustainability, if I can lump all modern industrial endeavor and corporate strategy under that common umbrella that Piasecki writes about, 
has raced from its early adopter phase to mainstream in the short span of fewer than 10 years. Back in the 1980s, when Bruce began his series of books and his consulting firm, ecological advocates were called tree huggers and radicals. The entire movement was considered woo-woo. It did not understand the role of business in society. Now, the raging debate centers on issues such as the comparative advantages of energy recapture from industrial waste heat versus heat sourcing from landfills. And the debate is being conducted by folks who wear suits and swap business cards. There is no missing the longer, truer trend line embodied in Piasecki's work. I first saw it myself in the title of Bruce's prescient talk back in 2007, when I hired him to speak to my 360 leaders that week. As a result of his particular style and personal force, his World Incorporated argument has since appeared in Portuguese, Japanese, Italian, Greek, Korean, and other language editions. The world has come around to see the power and opportunity in this line of looking at competition. In Doing More With Less, Piasecki takes his three decades of learning and travel and compels us forward through a mix of narrative nonfiction, personal storytelling, and astute reflections on sports and modern times. This is a book about the management of the relationships between business and society. Moreover, it remains a revolutionary book about how to think about business in our new smaller century. In eight books now, Piasecki has pointed the way to his smart money view of cultural conflicts, Enterprise has its teeth into sustainability now, as Piasecki predicted. Some see it now as a lion gorging on its recent kill, quieting society. But Piasecki reminds us of a bigger story. This quiet transformation of business positioning is materializing under our feet in a fashion that has changed the lives of seven billion neighbors. Bruce has been promoting these values and ideas for 30 years, but each new book reapproaches the issues in a more mainstream and more commanding fashion. In the business setting, he has been a green pioneer and a master facilitator. As a consultant to governments and to big business, and as a public speaker in many nations and to many smaller firms, he has guided corporate strategic thinking and changed lives. I know many who now see him as the father of social response capitalism, foretold in the next six related chapters. Here, in Doing More With Less, Bruce more deeply and personally unwraps the future for and with you. This master work is transformative stuff. I hope you extract its full and lasting value. Gene Miller, Center for Urban Innovation, Director of the Gaining Ground Conferences, Chapter 6. Another Day Will Tell. Thus the old gentleman ended his harangue. The people heard it and approved the doctrine and immediately practiced the contrary, just as if it had been a common sermon. For the auction opened and they began to buy extravagantly. However, I resolved to be the better for the echo of it. And though I had at first determined to buy stuff for a new coat... I went away, resolved to wear my old one a little longer. Reader, if thou wilt do the same, thy profit will be as great as mine. I am, as ever, thine to serve thee. Benjamin Franklin, The Way to Wealth Franklin's warnings are special, like the clever caution here. Seldom predictable, always insightful and resourceful, Franklin reaches across 300 years to you. How does he do this? Yes, keep your old coat on, my friends, he suggests, for it is better to keep than to waste. Be prepared for many to ignore the warnings before us, but view that as a competitive advantage to you. This could make some of our shared future quite chilling, while it offers you a new way to wealth. I consider Franklin to be a friend for several reasons. While so many squander value, he compounded it for me. And although I normally like my friends alive, his sharp attacks on waste, 
the ways he outmaneuvered the average knuckleheads during his life, and his smart pleas for us to be industrious and frugal resonate in me like a Beethoven symphony. His way of speaking is about shaping our way in the near future, about sailing into new frontiers boldly and with positive effect. He informed, persuaded, and delighted, rather than simply informed. Franklin's sportive seriousness sounds like music to our ears, even after centuries. He is clever. He is honest. He is open. He knew that people will be people. Girls will be girls. Boys will be boys. Yet he embraced changing rules with grace and wit as he matured. And he always remembered, in a primal way, that money will shine its horrible truths onto people. His observations about money, people, and rules remain strong and steady, however much history changes. There will be winners and losers, but with time, more winners than losers overall. Some will be swamped by fate, while others will be lifted by it. Franklin's words have a higher fidelity to them, like a serious jingle. They sound right even before you reason through them. But where will the new songs of this century come from? The element of surprise. The third and last principle that I discuss is the umbrella concept that you have encountered in this book. It might help you write your own song of competitive frugality. The refrain is, doing more with less is success. We call this the umbrella concept because it helps you come in from the rain of the modern world and live that life of self-determination you crave. You can now add the skills from figure 6-1 to your days on Earth. After some thought, perhaps we can add other key phrases, such as squaring your powers with social needs, self-determination based on restraint, aligning money, people, and rules for a smaller world, and finding surprising and innovative solutions. Here you begin to sense the ultimate domain of this book. I am not writing so much about a new age as a return to a sense of the self in society that goes way back, and yet is ready, with force and grace, for tomorrow. In each part of this book, you have reflected in deeper and deeper ways on this mantra or set of meanings from watching it in sports and competition, to examining new forms of policy and health care and environmental protection based on competing on frugality. This repetition, through returning and circling back, was, of course, deliberate. Those who play musical instruments know that composers put false cadences in their work to help listeners refocus their attention. I have found that gifted conversationalists and executives do this as well, almost instinctively, as do superb public speakers. No one can make it past 90 minutes without being rekindled this way. It is the same with six-chapter books. I respect deeply your patience to have made it this far in this adventure. Coming Home with Ben Franklin The best citizens achieve results in their lives this way. They know the ends and the means, and they frugally and competitively pursue the goal— they remain fully grounded in this adventure. They become neither astral nor idle in their hopes. Doing more with less will bring success. By declaring this end point earlier in your life, by working the principles as a great lawyer works a jury through guided discovery, you save and excel and succeed through a kind of self-determination rewarded by this global market. Whether you know it or not, you have arrived in a place of unexpected advantage in feeling the impact of this mantra. You have arrived at the nexus where competition and frugality meet. Here you find the same fundamental set of basic human resources that allows deeper satisfaction in this world. Are you close enough to feel this in your bones and muscles, not just in your head? This is not idealism. It is arrival in this century. Some call this state of self-determination and creative frugality mindfulness. Many cultures have long traditions of returning the human to this state of mindfulness via meditative calm. We've designed this book as an umbrella to help you come in from the usual reins of modern life 
and to return, in a sense, to your more established and long-standing sanctuary. Look around, now that you've arrived home. How much more you can do with less. It may prove the same with you. The arrival is yours. This book is here simply to guide you, to help you discern how to remain in the game for the future without losing your footing in humanity. And that has as much to do with you and your friends as with me and my principles. I believe you need to load these new songs of competitive frugality onto your iPod. Take it to the gym and let the songs play as you work out. You need to wire them into your family whenever they gather for feasts and festivities. What you once called your time for yoga, your time for reading, your time for self-discovery, might soon become your entire day. Cultural creatives often achieve this wholeness in their lives. They come to a point where work is life and life is playful discovery, and they often achieve that freedom from fate through frugality and friendship, not through excess or constant doing. Watch Alison Krauss, for example, as she masters her duets with James Taylor or John Waite. She is concise, friendly, loyal, and appreciative. All the principles we have laid out in this book about innovation and scarcity. There is a musicality to the thrust behind this book. As a social historian, I hope you end this read with a sense of where the world is headed and with some of the pleasures and profits and friends derived from catching the drift early, so as not to be blindsided by its swiftness and severity. This world waits for no one, my friends. A final hint. Here is a final hint on your way. There are stresses now in your life. In response, I hope to provide, in closing, access to a lovely song, and with it, suggestions on how to reduce the stress. James Taylor and Mark Knopfler sing a delicious historical ballad called Sailing to Philadelphia. I have listened to this duet about the creators of the Mason-Dixon line with wide-eyed appreciation, amazed at how the songwriter suggests so much in so little space. It lifts me, even when I am depressed or discouraged. The song is rich with historical narrative, as the two explorers, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, are both in the wild and very much in their heads. They are so different in their own ways, yet they share a risky mission to chart the Indian sky. They know that they are making a new America, and they know that this new world awaits their decisions. They are taking required risks, realigning money, people, and rules by the line they draw for their time, the Mason-Dixon line. The feeling in the song is not so much about undaunted or macho courage, even though the words Taylor sings suggest that the men know that their work may prove fatal. Instead, the song celebrates the well-traveled journey and a life that is worth living, as one encounters both freedom and fate. Mason and Dixon can feel the weight of an opponent's warring difference nearing them. The listener can also feel the weight of Indians near. As the surveyors turn into a new bay, they look beyond the current horizon of worry, beyond the bay, to where another day will make it clear. Why your stars should guide us here. There is a very human feeling in this song, this willingness to do what you must, knowing resistance, but knowing another day will tell all. In any work of consequence, from child rearing to building a company, the next days are the ones that matter. As Franklin often noted, you dig yourself out of a constrained past each day and become better tomorrow. The only way to transcend the foreboding that surrounds us, the only way to outsmart the logic of limits in our lives, is to rediscover that primary frugality at our start, Mason and Dixon brought this with them to the frontier, and James Taylor brings the same in his voice. If there were a human gene for it, we should have it cloned. Many of the principles in this short book, such as the statements about the art of competitive frugality, will become more real over time. As we turn the corners into our shared tomorrows, these principles will unfold with more force and certainty. Can you feel that now? In this book, I celebrate some of the early adopters of these principles, 
from Marcus Aurelius to Benjamin Franklin to E.F. Schumacher. But they only began what you can finish in your life. They saw the need to compete for frugality, sustainability, and new products long before the advent of wall-to-wall -wall people and stricter environmental and financial rules. They sailed into their near future as avid adventurers. But what matters most is the tidal flow now forming. The fundamentals of money, people, and rules, although constantly subject to politics and the whims of fate, have some lasting fixed features. They fit us like Franklin's old coat, which he wisely chose to keep. The future importance of competition and frugality will mount with time. When, for example, the seven billionth human is born into this world, or the eight billionth, or the ten billionth, the equations of this book will take on a starker kind of truth. Life, for each of us, is short, and anguish abounds. Having written this book, what I know is that you can feel and discover and control your future through frugality. Each person adds a further reason to compete for frugality. I cannot erase the anguish evident in the needs of people on our earth, nor can I obliterate the pain of poverty, the shanty towns, the bribed officials, or the weak leaders of my daughter's near future. But there is another way to this future. It is yours or it is not. That is the choice before you. Writers write to transform their physical bodies into word bodies, but the physics surrounding their short lives remain immutable. These rules of humanity are set, as when Mason and Dixon saw through their warring opponents to an eventual Philadelphia. The principles and physics for frugality are set now before us. The chance to repress their importance is weakening with each new birth. As the individual mantra in Figure 6-2 demonstrates, we cannot change the physical facts, but we can and must change ourselves as we make, grow, and live. <laughs>